Welcome to Martin Luther Chapel's worship. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you are touched by the Holy Spirit and feel the love of Christ in our service today. Let us begin. Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess confess that we are in bondage to sin sin and and cannot free free ourselves. We We have have sinned sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have have not loved you with our whole heart, We have have not not loved our neighbors neighbors as ourselves. For For the sake sake of your Son, Jesus Jesus Christ, Christ, have have mercy on us. us. Forgive us, renew us, us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. 
Let us pray. O Lord, pour out upon us the Spirit to think and do what is right, that we, who cannot even exist without you, may have the strength to live according to your will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Scripture for today is from Romans chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. The Apostle Paul is writing, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Now I am speaking to you, Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I glorify my ministry in order to make my own people jealous and thus save some of them. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their ancestors. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they may now too receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. This is the word of the Lord. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Creed. I, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I, I believe, believe in Jesus Christ, Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Lord. He was, was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. 
He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In order for my example to work today, you either need to have a great imagination or have seen this type of artwork before. What I'm thinking about is a photo collage. And I'm not sure if that's what it's really called, but that was the best thing I could think of to describe this creation. What I'm talking about is normally about the size of a poster and when you are really close to it, you see many, many small pictures. There are probably a few hundred or thousands of little pictures depending on the size of the poster. You can see, you can look and see these small images, which are pictures of friends, family, any number of items. The order and reasoning for these very small images are not necessarily clear to you when you are close enough to see them. But if you back out slowly, you will start to notice some sort of pattern coming along. The smaller images start to fade into a blend of colors and shades, losing some of what makes them unique as you work your way backward more and more. Then you find yourself at a point where the shading has triggered your mind into seeing a larger image that fills the whole poster. At this point, you may be wondering what my example has to do with the reading. But let me move back into, or similar how we moved out of the poster, but we'll be moving into the Bible. The poster, or larger picture, would be the Bible in this case. When we look at it as a whole, we see a particular image or idea of God. Moving in a little closer, all these little parts, the various books, become the focus. And further in, the various stories of the people contained therein all make up and give us an image of God. As we move through the readings each week, we get another image to add to our collage and create a better image. This week is a smaller snippet of Paul's writing. This may not seem to give us a clear image to work with, and that is because it is taking small images of the 11th chapter, and we need to step back and see the whole picture. The image of this section is also the title of the sermon, People Who Live by God's Proclamation. You see that Paul is talking about the state of salvation for the Jewish people in the first couple of verses. Now, there have been discussions amongst theologians about whether, this, whether or not this is an anti-Jewish text, and does it lay the foundation for anti-Jewish sentiment in the Christian church? The thought is that God has rejected Israel and embraced the Gentile nations. But Paul makes it pretty clear from the get-go that God has not rejected Israel and holds to his promises. The first couple of verses read, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Now, this should remove any wonder if God still stands for the people that came before Jesus. This was addressed in a previous chapter of Romans and remains true today, that is God keeps 
his promises. Now, the second part of our text may be the reason that theologians are confused. Paul says he is now talking to the Gentiles and calls himself an apostle to the Gentiles. He is somehow making the Jews jealous, but to what purpose? The Jews were once looked at as the chosen people, the promised Messiah that would come from them, likely made them develop a superiority complex. You may even see this develop within some Christians as they try to say that only certain behaviors will work for all cases. And that unless you meet a certain number of criteria outside of Christ, then you will not be accepted by the church. It's starting to sound like the Pharisees. But honestly, it gets a little confusing. And in reality, instead of puffing out our chests and showing how great we are, we are supposed to take a stance of humility. We bow before our Lord Jesus, and so with our interactions with others, instead of beating them down and telling them how horrible they are, try to lift them up. Take the time to realize the humans around you are equally worthy of God's love. Do not be so full of yourself, but be full of Christ. To do this, you need to shed some many preconceived notions that you assume out of the world and return to a right relationship with Christ. You are not better because you're a Democrat or Republican. You are a fan of a particular sports team or college. And most certainly not because you have money or think that you are wiser than anyone else. Jesus did not pay any mind to these things. Instead, Christ went to the lowly, to those in need. Jesus ate with sinners that society looked down their noses to. He ate with tax collectors, Samaritans, who the Jews wanted nothing to do with. Maybe this is similar to your political stances. But J Jesus ate with prostitutes, with lepers, and the lowliest people you can imagine. The importance of eating with these people must not be overlooked. To us, it was not a big deal to eat with someone. But in these times, in Jesus' day, it was a great sign of connection and communion to eat together. Breaking bread, as it was, was seeing the other people as your own equals and saying that you share with these other people's lives. Paul, showing that Gentiles are equal to God's chosen people in the eyes of God, likely made them jealous for that special place that they once had, which has shifted to all people who believe in Christ. It appears that Paul is counting on this prideful condition to be held in a special place by God, to get those Jews to put their pride aside and come follow the only begotten Son of God. He does not desire for them to continue to miss out on Jesus' saving grace, but instead return to the light and life that is in Christ. This moves us to our final view of the text. As I have already stated clearly, I hope you will hold to it. These people that you are thinking are your enemies are really not. And I challenge you to reach across party lines, your own insecurities, break down any barriers or boundaries that are keeping you from seeing each other as human beings that want God's love. We are all together in the body of Christ. There are going to be people who may not know any better and fall into sin, but because of they put the things of this world ahead of Christ. It is foolhardy, foolhardy to cut yourself off from the body of Christ because of this. Instead, return to God's word. We are to truly believe in the words that we speak in our confession, the creed, the commandments, and the Lord's Prayer. We carry these things on our hearts, not just on Sunday, but every day. 
When we carry these words with us, it changes our lives for the better. You will hold Christ close to your heart and you will open your heart to the changes that the Holy Spirit needs to make in you. You will be taking the basket off the light and letting it shine into the world. Your change for the better may be the catalyst for someone close to you or even someone that you don't even know. When you carry these things in your heart and not the hate and do what it is that God wants you to do, he will reward you greatly. You will have new eyes. You will be able to see all the blessings that are bestowed upon you through his grace and his mercy. The people who believe or who live by God's proclamation are not just in the Bible, but people from many different walks of life and are walking around us every day and even you. We follow God's teaching in his word and through his son, Jesus Christ, who died upon the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for service again. Uh, keep an eye on the chapel chatter. There are a lot of new exciting things going on as the students return to school. There are going to be more and more announcements coming up in our effort to support the students. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who helped put the service together. There are a lot of people behind the scenes and without their help, we couldn't really make this thing happen. And uh, all of their giving has allowed this to become a reality for everybody else every single week. And speaking of giving, uh, don't forget, you can give your uh, tithes and offerings via the website, uh, mail-in check, or through the telephone number that's on your screen. Remember, giving is not only financially, but also of your time. So we have a lot of events that may be coming up and you could be participating in. So keep an eye on that. Uh, we have Bible studies every week. The 20 and 30 something is meeting the wine, women, and the word is also meeting weekly. And the family and children 
uh, ministry is also meeting for a Bible study. Uh, when you enter the church, make sure you use the sign-in sheets and let us know that you're here so we can maintain our cleanliness and keep everybody safe. Also, if you are in need of communion, give us a phone call at the office and we will get you set up uh, for yourself or for your family units. Thanks, and let's return to service. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, we pray for the whole church and church leaders around the world. We pray for the faith community of Martin Luther Chapel. And although we long for the day we can all worship together in person, please use this time in the Holy Spirit working through us to show your love and mercy to all and serve those in need. May your holy presence continue to strengthen our faith and give us guidance. Lord, in your mercy. For families, for friends, for neighbors, Lord, you grant us comfort, hope, in your mercy, uh, health, if it be your will, uh, sustain us through this time of isolation and remind us that you are always with us to the end of the age. Lord, in your mercy. Dear God, this has been a crazy year, but we thank you for the opportunity to meet and we thank you for the opportunity to go back to school, whether that's online or that's in person. We ask you to be with the students as they prepare to go back, keep them safe, and help them to remember that in everything you're in control. We also ask you to be with the professors as they prepare their lessons, also help them to stay safe, and help us to come back willing to learn more and keeping us in your word. In your name we pray. Father God, I thank you for this amazing opportunity that we have to worship together, even in this time that we cannot be together in person. I ask that you would be with our leaders in the local, state, and national setting, and that you would guide them and give them peace in this time of uncertainty and national struggle. I ask God that you would be with all of the people that are being affected by these decisions and that you would continue to guide our leaders. I ask that you would comfort all of us and that you would just keep giving us peace. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Lord, I want to thank you for families and all the good things that you have given each of us. Please keep us united and our bonds strong as the days pass. Under your protection, fill our life with harmony, hope, and health. Let us find peace in these difficult times and comfort in your words. I also come to you today to lift up those who are alone. I pray that in your grace and mercy, you would draw near to all of those that are in need of spirit and give them strength during these trials. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Taught by the Lord and trusting in his word, we are bold to pray. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy thy kingdom kingdom come, come, thy thy will be done, done, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give to you his peace. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Give them heaven, folks. Thank you.